Hello. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um... I'm going to share my screen and we need Dan as well. Yes, he's connecting. Excellent. Okay, so Dan, if you want to adjust your camera just a little bit, we're seeing more of the ceiling than your face. But um, besides that, I think we're all set. Um, I'm going to turn it over to um, this presentation, which we started this block with a presentation about how publishers interact with PIDs, which I think is a really important topic. Um, and we're ending this block of with um, how PIDs and software interact as well. And I think it's also another emerging and important topic that we need to, as a community, really spend much more time on than we have. So I really appreciate the two of you coming in and, and spending the next 30 minutes with us discussing this. So I'll take it away. Thank you, John, and thank you, everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to start because we are at the hour. Um, and so we are here today to talk about PIDs and software, PIDs for software, shedding some light on a dark puzzle. Um, I have Daniel Katz with me here. He's chief scientist at NCSA, University of Illinois, and he's also chair of the Software Citation Implementation work, Working Group, which is a force 11 working group of both the um, RDA um, Software Identification Working Group and uh, chair of the FAIR for Research Software Working Group. And I'm here, um, Moran Gripter, I don't know if you know me, uh, soft and software engineer and metadata specialist at uh, INRIA Research Center uh, for the Software Heritage team. Uh, we collect, preserve, and share all the software source code. At least that's our ambitious goal. So um, our and sessions just to, today. Just, yeah. to, just to jump in for a second, I was going to say that um, I'm I'm actually co-chair of a bunch of those things with other people. And as is the case with almost any organization, where you have the, the people that are the co-chair that have the title, then you have the people that do the work. And Moran is almost always the person that does the most work in all of these groups. So it's, it's great <laughs> we're able to do this together. Thank you, Dan. And for jumping in, it's always a pleasure to hear that. Uh, but uh, yes, it is uh, groups that are called by a community and many people are involved to create those activities and outputs and today we want to share with you some findings that we had with the software source code identification working group um, which we had uh, published on the RDA um, and now it's also available on Zenodo and that's what we'll do today but we'll do it in a fun way with a poll trying to get you to answer before uh, giving you all the answers also because we don't have all the answers it's a very, very complex uh, puzzle to identify software. So we'd like to have your input and your opinions here. And um, there are three ways uh, to give your input. We have a poll uh, ready that will be on the Crowdcast platform. I don't know if you try to use that, but it will be um, uh, below um, next to the word people. There was, will be a, a, a flag um, that you could click on. There's an ask a question um, that you, where you can ask questions. So you feel free to ask questions on the ask a question, but we will put also our question there so you can comment and answer our questions in that, um, in that, um, in that, uh, well, in that place. And you can al always, as always, um, talk to us on the chat and, um, uh, give your feedback there. So I'm going to move on to our next slide, which is a question. And I see that our moderator uh, is working on to get the poll right now. So the question is, are you dealing with software in your daily work? And uh, since in the poll here on Crowdcast, you can choose only one, um, you can go and choose the yes, all of the above, or just one of the other uh, yeses. Or if you are not dealing with software, that's not, not uh, don't be ashamed of that. You can always um, click on the not yet um, uh, possibility. So here I see the poll uh, is right up. Um, and so you can click on it and see what the answers are. What are you doing when you do? Um, um, when you do with software, how you are dealing with software. 
and it will be very nice to see um, your answer there. I'm not going to put this question this question on the ask a question because I think it's a um, kind of a close one. If someone wants to share it, their experience with software, feel free to do so. I'm going to move to the next slide. Uh, I'm just going to see the, the poll. We have for the moment 40%. 43% saying yes, all of the above, and some are using, and some are in not yet, not there yet. Um, going to our next slide. Um, so something that I wanted to say, I'm not going to take a lot of time on the, about the slide, that the software is really all around us. And I'm really using here two um, examples that you might know, the Apollo 11 mission with all the source code uh, printed on the right of, uh, well, next to Margaret Hamilton. And you have uh, the invention of Tim Berners-Lee, the World Wide Web. Where will we, where will we be without it? Uh, I think we wouldn't be here on Crowdcast um, celebrating PID Appalooza, right? <laughs> um, Going next to the second question on the poll. So I know that uh, normally the questions are kept in the little um, um, bottom there where it's poll. And I'm hoping that our moderator is quick enough to go, yes, I see that the next question is already up there. So go ahead and go and vote. So the question is, have you heard about or read the RDA 411 software source code identification output where well, well, that's the thing that we are going to talk about today. So uh, let's see if people have um, heard about it, read it and commented during the community review or not yet. And they are re really glad to be here and to know what it's about. And just in case people haven't noticed, um, if you have one of the polls open, you can scroll down and then you'll see more polls as they appear, so. Yes, thanks Dan, exactly, uh, I forget to, to say that. I see that a lot of all of the people present here heard about it at least fifty two percent oh not yet um some some voters so that's good because you're here to hear about it so I'm glad that you're here um and I'm going to give the hand to the mic to Dan uh to um share a bit about the um working group. Right. So just um, just this is going to be really quick. This is probably a slide that has too many words, but we had a, a source, software source code identification working group that was active for about 18 months under both um, RDA and Force 11 as the kind of umbrella organizations. Uh, Martin Fenner and Roberto De Cosmo and I were the co-chairs. And what we did basically over this time was to was to look at a bunch of different um, possible um, identifiers for software, who the, uh, who the overall actors were, um, how we could identify software in a different granularities, um, kind of a bunch of use cases, different identifiers, and then we wrote this report that tried to, to summarize all of the different pieces. And, and so that's, um, I think that's really all that I want to say about the slide is that the, the report is available. Um, and we will, um, a, a bunch of the rest of the, the talk here then is going to be um, looking at some of the different aspects of it and trying to trying to see how the audience here compares with the people that were in this and, and we can try to use this information to, to understand uh, how accurate the, the report was and also to get feedback on how we could actually use the report because as, as Moran said at the beginning, um, there's lots of different options and it's not at all clear how we how we standardize these and even if we should standardize these. So uh, maybe next slide. Yes. And... Ah, yes. So we have another question. Um, and I see that it's now appeared magically in the polls button. Uh, so the, the question is kind of what, what, what kind of a stakeholder are you within the scholarly ecosystem? All right. With the idea, again, that different kinds of stakeholders um, are playing different roles in terms of their need for software identifiers and their use of software identifiers.
And we'll just let this go for a minute and see what people say. I've also added this question in the ask a question. So if you want to uh, leave a comment and not just answer the poll, because in the poll one, you just click on, on one vote. And if you want to say something else about your role, uh, you can do that in the ask a question box. OK, so we're getting a lot of some other role and a surprising number of researchers. Uh, as well as registry admins and curators, which I guess seems reasonable. Less less funders than I might have expected. Less publishers. Oh, okay, one more publisher. Thank you. Okay, well maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll go on to the next slide and we'll we'll kind of talk about this a little bit. So the there's a bunch of different um, actors that we described in the uh, in the report, and and again each of these actors has a different way in which they interact with um, software identification and software identifiers. Um, and so just as an example, the, the publisher may be interested in identifiers from the point of view of, of citation, how they get included in citations. Uh, the researcher might be interested in terms of how, uh, how, how, how they track the software they've been using, maybe how they express it for reproducibility. The software engineer may be thinking about it in terms of how they get credit for what they've developed. So each of these actors is, has some use case. And we went through all of them um, fairly carefully and tried to describe a bunch of these different use cases. So uh, next, yeah, thank you. So the next poll question then is, um, is, is kind of thinking about you and your different in, in your use case. Uh, do you actually have a need for, sort of, for software source code identifiers? And if so, where do you need it? Right, and, and I'll just point out that as we're as people are filling this out, um, we have the idea that software can identify other software that it needs. The data can identify the software that's either used to generate it or to analyze it. Um, the, right, the, the software identifiers, of course, go into reports and, and writing. That we know that, um, and that's the most standard thing today. But all these other options are also places that we potentially need to identify software uh, as we go forward on time. Okay, so it's uh, interesting to see lots of in different settings, um, which makes sense, and that's good to see. A uh, different setting could be uh, data sets and products and provenance related. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I think Justin's point is right. Okay, maybe we'll uh, we'll go forward one more as we continue. Oh, sorry, one more question. Uh, I do. I forgot that we didn't have anything in between questions, so I'm making, that, making <laughs> I the moderators work too hard. <laughs> I forget as well that we had to. Okay. Thank you, John. So we now have another question or whoever is behind the scenes there. Um, so if, if you click on a software PID, um, what do you want to come back in some sense? When do you want it to resolve to? And this is one of the things that really is a is one of the challenges is that there's a bunch of different answers to this, and different identifiers resolve to different things as well. And so it, this is part of the part of the the confusion about software identifiers at this point. Uh, we didn't write a paper, but that's I would say five years ago that probably would have been the main answer people would have given. I'm glad uh, glad we didn't put that as an option. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, so I see a bunch of people that are interested in the in the project, uh, a lot in the source code itself, uh, some in an image, some in some documentation, uh, and some that say it depends, which is which is good. Okay, so I think then next we go back to Moran for the next slide. Yes, I'm going to um, go over a little bit what we described in the report. Um, we um, did figure out that there are many things that we want to identify when we want to identify software, and they are not at the same level. So we came up with this uh, granul granularity level uh, pyramid where uh, projects are on the top 
and code fragments are on the bottom just because there are a lot of code fragments just for one project and in between you have different kind of uh, levels that can be very um uh well can be the artifacts themselves with the source code but they can be also the idea of the project so you have the software concept and project and the version for example if you look at python you have the python project but you have python 2 and python 3 which are different things and then inside them there's um different modules sub modules and then the artifacts the uh, source code, the releases, and in these uh, type of um, um, uh, artifacts, you have also commits, directories, files, and then, as I said before, on the bottom, the code fragments, which are can be algorithms, and you might want to um, identify uh, different things with different use cases. Uh, also, we have things that are contextual um, artifacts, uh, the software environment, tutorials, data um, that are used for tests or even data that produced with the software that, that's on the software context. And uh, of course, you have also articles that describe the software or documentation that's um, that you might want also to identify. So there's a lot of things that you can uh, want to identify. I'm going to the next slide with a question about the use case because we've seen the targets. And now, uh, looking at the use cases, uh, we need to think about what are the use cases we have to, um, to identify software. Why do we want to identify software? For which purpose? And this is where we came up also in the report with a large collection of use cases. So you go ahead to the poll and uh, answer that what's the most important use case in your workflow so we have giving credit or getting credit as a as an author as a developer um, to reproduce an experiment that's something that you need to identify a software piece a piece of software for reproducible reproducibility uh, curate software metadata access the software source code to use it or none of the above because um, those use cases doesn't interest you, but that, that that's not a bad thing. Yeah, there are so many use cases, we, we couldn't put all the use cases here. So um, if you want to share also a use case, you can do it on the chat or on the questions. I'm going to put that question in the question box and see what you have answered. Hmm. Um, so in the in the poll, I see that there is a lot about curation of software metadata. That's um, that seems reasonable for PID Appalooza. Um, PIDs are for curation as well. So that's um, that's an interesting. Um, well, uh, use case. Uh, I see in the chat the provenance of uh, of da data. Uh, some about credit, uh, that's the next um, choice, and then access to the software source code to use it. That's that's very nice. I also, as I said before, put the question in the um, in the question box, so you can uh, scroll down the question box and get us answers in comments. Um, it's uh, normally uh, start with presenters question number something. I'm going to move on to our next slide and give the floor to Dan. Right, thank you. Um, so yeah, so I, I completely agree with Justin. I think that this is uh, amazingly skewed if we, uh, when we've asked this with other audiences, we've gotten very different answers. Uh, a lot of people um, are really interested in reproducibility uh, and access and, and credit and curating the software metadata is something that I think is uh, uh, in most other contexts is a very unusual answer to get. So it's uh, it's interesting to see it here. Um, right, so in terms of, of use cases, um, this the intent of the slide is not to, to talk about all these use cases, but just really to, to try to express that we did think about this pretty carefully and we tried fairly strongly to uh, to talk with a variety of people and get a variety of different use cases. And, and again, the challenge is that these different use cases have different, uh, sorry, in the context of these different use cases, different identifiers have pros and cons. 
Um, and that's part of the overall uh, challenge, or as, as Maggie said, the, the, the darkness here um, is that we, we don't really think that we can ever have one uh, identifier to, to rule them all. Um, but that's, again, where we want to try to, to figure out what, what we could do. Um, so let's, let's go on to the next question. Right, and so are, are you actually using a software identifier? <laughs> and again, this is in the polls now. I'm very impressed by the two people that say yes all the time because I can't even put myself in that category. Oh, three now. <laughs> I'm one of the three people. <laughs> right. So maybe I should change it to sometimes, but it's more all the time than sometimes, but it's because I'm a, I'm a sweet fan, so. Yeah, yep, yeah, Git commits IDs are, are certainly one, uh, one kind of identifier, although there's a little bit of an issue about how persistent they are, but uh, we, we can talk about that separately. That's something I don't think I can say three times fast. I'm uh, so I, I think just for Martin's thing, I would say I'm not I'm not completely sure that you necessarily use software identifiers in the version control systems. The version control systems give you software identifiers, but whether or not you actually use them is I think is a question. Uh, some people certainly do. A lot of users probably don't. Uh, they just use latest potentially or something like that. Um, okay, so having having done that, let's um, let's go on to the next slide, which yes. is apparently back to Moran. Yes, this is um, a slide where I just say that we on the um, on the um, software identification output, uh, we had a panorama of um, a landscape of identifier schemes and. Most of them are here on the uh, on this slide. It is a small example of identifier that can be used for software. And here today, we are going to um, present uh, some schemes that we uh, also describe in the report. And I will start with um, an intrinsic identifier that you might not all know, but is dear to me. It is uh, the SWID, the Software Heritage Identifier. It is an intrinsic identifier, which is like a unique digital fingerprint, really similar to a commit hash, because if you want to identify a commit hash, you can use the hash in its Swede um, setting and come and see if it's in the Software Heritage Archive. So to explain a little bit about the Swede, uh, you have a prefix with SWH, you have the schema version, because if we will going, going, go change the SHA-1 that's here, it will change the scheme. We don't know what the future um, will present to us, so that's that's good to have a scheme for, schema version. Then you have the uh, object type. You can have a, here we have a content, but you can have different object types that are in a software source code, um, uh, that can that are self source code artifacts. So you have a snapshot, which is a visit that's made on a repository, a release. You all know what's a release, I imagine. A revision, which is a commit. Um, it's a point in time where you can get all the um, history uh, from that point, a directory, and of course a file. And in the file, you can also give a qualifier, which is the lines of code to identify a specific code fragment. So if you want to identify an algorithm, you can do it with um, this qualifier. And I'm not going to not look at the chat because it, it makes me, uh, um, well, lose my words. So uh, it's a really cryptographically strong identifier and it's decentralized. You can calculate your suite locally. You don't need a registry. Um, it's an agreement on the standard how to calculate this um, hash and have a suite. So that's 
um, the advantages of the suite and its intrinsic. And then when we go over to extrinsic identifier, we have a great collaboration uh, software heritage with the HAL uh, Archive Ouverte, which is the Nas French National Open Archive. And there um, you can have both a uh, suite and HAL ID. A HAL ID is a more high level identifier where researchers come and comes and deposit metadata on a uh, software and uh, this um, software and metadata is then uh, moderated and uh, transferred to software heritage. So you have different use cases that can be answered with both HAL ID and uh, SWID. Um, the next uh, option that I'm going to show you is the Wikidata entities, uh, which are for more high level um, identification, but it can identify many things in the uh, granularity levels that we shown you before. Here we have an example with Sage Math, and also um, to show you that even though um, there's a Wikidata entity uh, identifier, you have different external identifiers that can be um, mapped inside a ent uh, Wikidata entity. So you can then add the multitude of identifiers that do identify the same, the same software. And so I'm going over to the next slide, which is then slide about identifiers from registries. Right. Um, so I'm. Uh, I have to say, I'm. I'm just curious to know if anybody else has noticed the way that uh, Moran and I are figuring out who's giving each slide. Uh, and if so, it would be interesting to see in the chat. But, uh, but let me talk about just briefly about identifiers from registries, that um, that there are at least three different disciplinary specific registries that have appeared. Um, RRIDs, or SciCrunch, from the life sciences, um, ASCL from astronomy, and SW Math from mathematics. And, and these registries appeared because there was a need that they were filling. Yes, thank you, John. Um, they let the community register different types of objects, including software, um, and, and they have an organization then that curates the entries. And so they, the intent of that organization is that it, it makes sure there aren't duplicates, to make sure that the, the data is there, that the metadata is there, things like that. Um, and those entries then can be used within papers within those disciplines because the registry is known to the discipline, and particularly like ASCL is, is tied into ADS, which is the, the indexer in astronomy, and, and AAS, the, the publisher. Um, but the problem that happens a little bit is that each of these discipline-specific registries are independent, and because software can cross disciplines, the registries can have overlapping content. And so that gets um, a little bit um, a little bit confusing, and and so it just adds to the the complexity of the situation at this point. Okay, next. Uh, okay, and then one of the other kinds of um, identifiers that show up are for articles, um, in particular software papers. Uh, and so, uh, as one of the, um, the, the co-founders of JOS, I just wanted to mention JOS briefly as, as one of the options here because it actually has multiple identifiers for an article. Um, it has the idea that people that have written software can write fairly short articles about that software and get them reviewed, and the review includes a review of the software itself. The research packages then have two DOIs. There's the DOI for the article, and in the left column of that, one of the links in the, on, the, on the side there is a link to the software repository itself, typically through Zenodo or Figshare or some other kind of a, an archival repository. So the JOS paper has a DOI that's coming out of Crossref, and the, the software itself has a DOI that's typically coming out of Datasite, uh, and they're linked together in terms of their metadata. And so this gives people an option to either cite the software directly or to cite the reviewed paper about the software. Um, and it's really kind of up to the, the, uh, the, the person that wants to use this as a use case about which of these makes the most sense to them. For us, we would like the JOS one to go away over time and just to have the software one. But for right now, there's a need for the software one, uh, for the paper one as well in some cases. So overall, um, next slide. Uh, I think where we're, where we're trying to kind of say is that there's there's lots of different issues here. There's different granularity of software that you might want to cite. There's different kinds of identifiers, both extrinsic and intrinsic. And depending on what you want to do, there's usually multiple identifiers that you can do it with. But there's no identifier that really does everything exactly. 
and there's not really any um, use case for which you could use all the identifiers. So this is kind of where we are, that, again, that we're in this, this confusing situation. And so I think we want to leave you with one last question, um, which hopefully is one that we can answer through the questions. It's not really a poll, but it's really, what do you think we should actually do now? Right? How, how do we resolve this? Do we try to federate these different um, disciplinary specific registries as an example? Do we try to agree that there's just one of these things that we should use? Do we try to convince the publishing and indexing community that they should be really flexible and allow six different kinds of identifiers depending on what people want to do? Uh, what's, what's, what is the solution? We're, uh, we are, well, I don't know if I'd say we're equally confused, but we are somewhat confused. <laughs> Okay, and so I think it'd be great for people to put answers in the um, ask a question. I also think we can maybe move that over into Slack because we are running out of time. Um, so just to let you know that we have a channel for software peds on Slack. So you should go directly to that uh, channel to discuss uh, software peds. Okay, I think that'd be great. Um, why don't we go ahead and move this question over into the session Q&A and then include that channel as part of the answer so that there's also that connection for people that documented yes. in Slack for people to know. And then exactly. also it'd be great later today and tomorrow to just ping the general channel and say, hey, there's a conversation going on about software PIDs because I think there is a real important conversation that needs to happen specifically about this issue that I think a lot of people who maybe aren't awake right now might want to join in later. Right. Yes, I agree. Yeah, so we, uh, thank you very much. And I, I apologize, we need to cut off the time. Um, yep, but any you. last words? I, I was just going to say that the, the the little cue was that the, the, the slides with the purple Pitapalooza are mine and the ones that had a blue Pitapalooza were Moran's. So I was curious <laughs> if anybody oh, wow. noticed that. But nice. Hmm. I think my big face is in front of the color. So uh, maybe it's uh, all of them had my big old head in front of it. So um, anyways, yeah, thank you very much to both of you. and. Um, we're going to go ahead and end this session now, and um, we can see people over in um, the Slack channel. Uh, we're going to be moving into a party time, which actually has uh, a couple fun activities that are going on, including Jeopardy, which is, um, you know, Jep Pitter, Pitty. Pit um, there's a chance for you to join some teams, and we're going to be doing a session around uh, PID trivia. So one of the many fun activities we have going on at Pitapalooza. Um, following that, we'll be moving right back into more sessions. So thank you very much.